Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Uh, we have a great guest on today. This is Richard. He's also known on the internet as Vegan Gains, and I'm really excited to have him here. Richard, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, so, uh, Richard, uh, you've been uh, promoting a vegan diet for a long time and doing it quite well. I just want to get into a little of your backstory uh, for people that are uh, new to being a vegan or questioning if they should go there. Can they be successful? You obviously have been successful at it. So uh, first, briefly introduce yourself and then we'll get into how you started and where you're at now and what you're planning in the future. Yeah, sure. So my uh, real name's Richard. Um, I first got into veganism because a friend at the time shared a Gary Rofsky speech on Facebook. And uh, I thought it was kind of interesting because the, uh, the guy who was a friend of mine at the time, um, he was big into, big into eating a lot of meat because he was doing bodybuilding and he shared that Gary Rofsky speech with uh, with the title in his post saying, I'm never eating meat again. And I thought, wow, okay, that's pretty interesting. So I clicked on the Gary Rofsky, uh, you know, video. And uh, he destroyed every argument I possibly could have had to not, you know, not be vegan. Um, he talked about the ethics, which was the most powerful, you know, part of that speech. Uh, he talked about health, uh, where I thought, uh, you know, since I was growing up, but like I was always taught that I, that I needed meat to be healthy and needed it for vitamins and minerals. Destroyed that argument. Uh, just, you know, talked about the environment. And, and I, I just couldn't come up with any excuse uh, to ever eat meat again. So from that day on, um, I never ate meat or animal products again. And and I actually showed that video to my mom and she went vegan with me, uh, with me. Wow. Um, yeah. And funny enough that, uh, that friend, he, he went back to eating meat after two weeks. He said, um, yeah, I tried, but I just wanted to eat meat again, but. All right. So yeah. we need to talk about that because with the evidence so clear that people would still go back on something. But how old were you when this happened? Um, it was just before my 19th birthday. So I would have been, um, yeah, like 18 and, uh, you know, about 10 months. Okay. And uh, how old are you now? 33. 33. So you went vegan right away. Did you know what you were doing or did you just stop eating animals? And do you st do you still do the same thing you did then? Or have you made changes over the years? Yeah, so um, I, I was pretty interested in like bodybuilding and nutrition back then. So I knew how to appropriately plan my meals just in general. Um, I was eating fairly well at the time. Um, ever since I was a kid, I actually ate a lot of, uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, my mother was a terrible cook, just terrible. Uh, I think she actually gave me food poisoning, uh, at least once from giving me like uncooked meat. So my favorite food growing up was actually just raw fruits and vegetables because that's something she couldn't mess up. So, you know, like apples, oranges, grapes, uh, and I, I actually really liked raw, raw broccoli. Even to this day, I still actually really like raw broccoli. Um, so switching to vegan wasn't difficult at all for me. Uh, the only reason I was really eating meat at the time was, again, because I thought I needed it for bodybuilding and for, like, nutrition and protein, Never was particularly interested in eating it. Um, so it was pretty easy transition for me. Um, initially, yeah, it was kind of strange uh, cutting meat completely out of my diet. Um, by the time I actually discovered this whole vegan thing, uh, the only meat I was really eating with uh, regularity was fish because... Chicken is just really disgusting. It's slimy and gross, and you have to have, uh, you know, its own cutting board so you don't 
contaminate other things. So, uh, again, made the transition fairly easy. Um, I was, like, super worried about getting enough protein, so I was eating just a ton of beans. Um, like, that was almost all I was eating. And then, you know, I, after about two weeks, I just realized, okay, I can have more foods. Um, so... first two weeks um i didn't have any digestive upset or anything from eating like a ton of beans uh never had problems like that uh i did lose weight um pretty quickly like i noticed the first month um i lost about an inch inch and a half to my waist uh probably just from cleaning up your your, your diet and everything Um, and just once I spread out, started eating some more foods and not just beans, uh, I think I was eating like beans and quinoa, uh, felt better. Uh, so just a lot of fruits and vegetables, beans, lentils, tofu, you know, just a, a nice big spread. Um, my diet hasn't changed all that much. For the most part, uh, the biggest thing that's changed would probably be uh, just the sometimes foods. So, you know, I, I went vegan quite a while ago. That was before Beyond Meat. So now with the options that are available, you know, there's so many vegan restaurants you can go out and uh, eat like Beyond Meat or Gardein. Some of that's changed where if I go out occasionally... Um, or have some, you know, special foods to treat myself. That's changed, but for the most part, haven't made too many big changes. Sure. Uh, being a promoter of this, uh, so you're doing the vegan diet more for nutrition. Did, did you ever get into the compassion No, side no. Of um, I'm vegan for ethical reasons. That's like, if I was only interested in nutrition, like... You know, uh, eating meat occasionally isn't going to kill you or anything. Um, the reason I never eat meat or animal products under any circumstances is for the ethical reasons. Now, from an ethical standpoint, uh, you know, some people will say there are a lot of vegans out there, but they're not they're being good from a diet standpoint, but they're doing other things that really aren't ethical to animals. Like, I mean, you can take it to like even using a car, the rubber and tires might be made from animals and stuff. And like there are some people that are really get deep into it. How deep do you get into that from an ethical standpoint? Well, um, I don't go by the vegan society's definition of veganism. I go by uh, a more modern definition where we're trying to give animals the same rights as human beings. So as long as you're not violating um, what I would consider an animal's rights, uh, I think you're doing fine. So I I've, I've heard of people make that tire argument uh, because I do know they do put some additives in tires that may or may not come from uh, animal origin. So to give it a, a particular type of Uh, stickiness or something on the road uh, especially when it gets it gets wet i think they do use some like animal sources of fat um not a, i haven't really researched that all that much but um even if it were the case i don't know if buying a set of tires would necessarily you know add up like i i guess over the course of your lifetime Uh, to an actual rights violation. Like there's a certain percentage of, you know, these byproducts that are being sold, um, you know, from the animal egg industry for these, uh, you know, different weird products like paint, glue. I don't know um, if you could actually calculate out how much that contributes to the animal egg industry where it would it would even add up to a rights violation um it, it would surprise me if you go through enough tires in your lifetime where it would actually equate to an animal died so I, i'm not too concerned about that um what i do know for sure is that when you are buying you know meat dairy eggs from the grocery store that absolutely very quickly adds up to you know an actual full murder Uh, and then not to mention, you know, the captivity, the exploitation abuse. So those are the big things. 
Um, obviously leather products, uh, you know, so like leather shoes, you know, that those are things that you absolutely have to avoid for. Sure. One of the things that I do in promoting the vegan diet is I, I'm a strong believer in the Bible. And one of the things I do is I, I have to explain to people uh, the reason why in the Bible God allowed man to eat meat and what the ideal diet for man is being in Genesis 129, fruits and vegetables. In your discussions with people, has does the Bible ever come up? Because a lot of people use it to defend eating meat, but like myself, oh, I yeah. use it to defend the original diet of man, fruits and vegetables. So what do you do when that comes up? Yeah, so from my perspective, veganism is a secular belief. Uh, I know there's like Seventh Day Adventists that believe, um, you know, God did have this plan for man to only eat plants. The issue is nowhere in the Bible does it ever grant animals human rights. So when you look at like the Ten Commandments, it says, Thou shalt not commit murder. It doesn't actually specify that animals are, you know, part of that commandment. Um, it does also explicitly state that it is okay to kill and eat animals. Um, it, it does specify which animals and which animals to avoid, but it, it does explicitly state that it's permissible to kill animals. So presumably animals wouldn't be part of that, uh, that commandment, thou shalt not murder. So from my perspective, yes, you, you can make a strong argument that the Bible does advocate for eating a plant-based diet. The issue is it doesn't actually grant animals rights. So that's what, so that's the reason why I think veganism is, is a secular belief. And when I argue for veganism, it's based on secular beliefs. Um, I did actually just, debate a guy yesterday uh just last night where he was trying to use the bible to argue for carnism you know for eating meat um you know i i ran through my normal set of secular arguments for that and i also did uh bother to point out that if you're christian you know like w would jesus be in favor of factory farming he said no. Then I'm like, okay, well, then you're not following Christ. And then he gave this, you know, terrible, you know, excuse that, well, we all sin. Well, you can't just say this is wrong and then do it. And then, you know, your excuse be, oh, well, we're all bad. Well, no, you're bad and you're choosing to be bad. And if you think you're going to be, you know, have the, the day of judgment, this probably isn't going to be a very good excuse, you know, in front of God. So... You know, I'll, I'll, you, you do have to kind of fight people on their level. So, you know, if that's their belief system, I will internally crit uh, critique their own belief system. Um, ideally, though, I, if I have the time, I will try to disprove, um, you know, their religious beliefs. I'm not Christian. Uh, I'm atheist. And if you want to be more specific, I'm an existential nihilist. So I, I do like destroying these uh, these kind of Christian belief systems, Muslim, Jewish belief systems, because fundamentally it's it's just dogmatic, and people don't even follow these scriptures. They just use scriptures to justify their own, you know, bad actions. Have you heard of the movie Christspiracy? I have. I still have to watch it. Uh, I keep getting busy and forgetting it, but I do have to watch it. Okay, I have to watch it as well. But the, in the trailer, they say, is there an ethical way to kill an animal? Because the Bible actually teaches, which sounds like an oxymoron, like we're to when it says we have dominion over animals, it doesn't mean we're supposed to kill and eat them. We're supposed to, we're supposed to take care of them, raise them. And, and even within Judaism, there's like a, a, a slaughter method, which is to kill the animal where they die instantly and feel no pain. And some other religions around the world uh, feel the same. But the, the movie is, is there an ethical way to kill an animal? Because it's kind of an oxymoron. You're still killing the animal, taking a life. But is there ethical yeah. ways to do that? So the Bible... Uh, I can guarantee yeah. you, if we follow the biblical passages, uh, it is not ethical. I've been to kosher slaughterhouses before. A really good friend of mine, Len, 
uh, he was able to break through um, their fencing, look right in the window. Like, damn, uh, it's bad. Um, cows were just being hung up, throat slit open. They were just writhing around in pain sometimes for minutes uh, just because the guy didn't slash deep enough into their throats. Um, it, it was horrific. But the idea, the idea, though, of cutting their throats so they do die instantly if it's done the right way. I mean, do you think, do you see any difference between that and factory slaughtering houses, slaughterhouses where they're just, there's no care about if they're in pain or not, or? Um, so with kosher slaughter, uh, any kind of ritualistic form of slaughter, they don't have to abide by humane slaughter methods. So with humane slaughter methods that are approved by, you know, like the Canadian or U.S. government, um, you have to stun the animal before slitting its throat open. Uh, so with cows, they typically use a bolt gun. Um, with pigs, it's uh, I, I think it's about half and half like electri uh, electrical stunning. Um, half of it's uh, CO2 gas. CO2 gas is absolutely horrible. That's horrifically cruel uh one of the worst ways you could possibly kill or stun an animal um i think uh chickens they they usually go through an electric bath where again the the water is charged and it, it stuns it stuns them these aren't perfect methods especially gassing uh the gassing absolutely should be banned but um i would imagine if these animals are stunned first where they're not conscious before slitting their throats open, that is probably causing less pain and suffering than if you were to just slit their throats open. Um, I, I know with some animals, uh, I know this is true of, uh, of rabbits because I own rabbits. If you flip them onto their back, it, it does something to their nervous system where it, 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 can put them to sleep or put them into a kind of stunned state. I don't know if that actually prevents them from feeling any pain, but um, yeah, th there's just no way these ritualistic forms of slaughter eliminate any kind of pain or suffering. Like again, at the end of the day, you're slitting somebody's throat open. Um, sure. I've seen people get their throat slit open and that does not look like a fun way to die. Now, now one of my arguments against, when people talk about just slaughtering animals in general from a biblical standpoint is the Bible says, or the purpose is to, to try to have that animal feel as least pain as possible. And I would say, well, hunting would be the worst of all and the most anti-biblical thing you could do because when you shoot a deer, you don't know if that bullet's going to kill it or you're going to hit the bullet. There's no, you don't know. And it's essentially roadkill now. Uh, it could die in a minute. It could die in 10 minutes. You don't know. So I try to, uh, you know, say hunting is not a biblical thing to do. Uh, and of course, people that eat meat and, and support all that, they just have such a different viewpoint and understanding of all these different things. And uh, I want to interview you. So because I, I really appreciate in your debates and your discussions, how you use this information uh to help people see this truth just like it was revealed to you so hopefully somebody will see this and realize hey he's got a great point there and reconsider uh what they're doing to these animals so another problem i have is promoting a vegan diet and lifestyle and living this way even though i'm in great health uh there's people that are on something like the carnivore diet that yeah. they 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 start eating a carnivore diet. They leave out everything except animals, and they start feeling better. Now they're leaving out everything that they were eating, not thinking, well, maybe that's why I'm feeling better. But they try to support the carnivore diet as something we could look from a health standpoint, an ethical standpoint, every standpoint. It's just terrible and deadly to themselves just as well. What do you do when you have a conversation with somebody that says, oh, I've been having such terrible health problems, but I switched to this carnivore diet and I feel great. What, what do you say to somebody like that? Yeah, so for one thing, self-reported, um, you know, feelings of just well-being in general, they're not very reliable. 
Um, there, like, I, I'm sure if you've lived long enough, we've all had a friend who's done stupid things, like gotten into drugs and said, oh, I, I feel fine. Um, you know, I'm doing great. Uh, you know, I try do heroin only occasionally or something. Um, so people can do really, really horrible things to themselves, like addictive drugs. And then they say they feel great. They feel better on the drugs than off the drugs. Um, there are things that can just happen to your brain um, with the way cer certain neurotransmitters work if you're starving yourself. Um, I I'm sure we've seen some people in the breatharian community uh, who just stop eating. And then they say they feel great. Um, again, uh, you know, going into ketosis or going into a starvation state, it can affect some neurotransmitter neurotransmitters in your brain. It can also affect some hormone values like cortisol and give you um, a bit more energy. It can give you like this fight, fight, fight or flight response and just make you feel a bit better. You feel a little more energetic, more wired. And um, that can kind of make you think, okay, I'm doing something good for my body. But no, you're just kind of fooling yourself. And it feels that way because your cortisol is elevated. It's giving you a bit more energy. Uh, some of the ketones you're producing, again, the way it affects some like neurotransmitters in your brain. Give it, it, it's giving you this kind of feel-good feeling, but those feel-good feelings aren't going to stop you from getting heart disease or diabetes or cancer. So that's one thing. I wouldn't rely entirely on just how you feel. Uh, you should get some objective uh, you know, measurements done on your like blood values, um, on your glucose metabolism, um, you know, inflammatory markers to actually see what this diet is doing. Secondly, because the diet is so extremely restrictive, um, not only are you cutting out good foods like fruits and vegetables, but you're also likely cutting out some very bad foods. So like Oreo cookies, potato chips, um, you know, greasy takeout food. Those foods might not have been, you know, allowing you to feel so good. And they might have also been preventing you from losing weight. Uh, a lot of people who also go on the carnivore diet also cut out alcohol. Uh, they might actually start smoke uh, or sorry stop smoking around this time or doing other recreational drugs. So generally, people who start getting interested in their health, following more restrictive diets, uh, getting into exercise, they also cut out recreational drug use at that same time. So. Most of this explains some of the self-reported improvements in their general mood, how they feel, and it also explains why they're able to lose weight. But there's also just clearly objective shortcomings of this kind of diet. Um, Plant-based dietary patterns are clearly ideal for health, so avoidance of saturated fat and cholesterol, um, lots of fruits and vegetables... Uh, high fiber diets and fats coming from poly and monounsaturated sources. That's clearly the ideal human diet, and the carnivore diet is the exact opposite of that. Sure. Uh, on a personal level, uh, how's your health, and do you get your blood work checked? Yeah, so my health has been fantastic, especially lately. Um, the only issues that I've had in terms of physical health, um, have really just been, uh, acute injury. So I had like, um, my kneecap dislocate over and over again. I needed corrective surgery for that. And then the surgery gave me an infection and, you know, stuff like that. So it's really just been acute injuries that have been the only physical health problems I've had. I've had mental health problems pretty much lifelong, but I I think I actually finally cured them. Um, I've experimented with magic mushrooms, and the last mushroom trip that I had, uh, I think my depression, my anxiety, all that's gone, and I've learned to just have perfect control of my emotions, and I've just been feeling great. 
Um, I do occasionally get blood work. I'm probably going to get blood work in the next few months uh, just because I'm dieting right now and I'm just going to see where I'm at. But, um, you know, C-reactive protein uh, is usually uh, extremely low or non-detectable. I've had a few times where I've gotten blood work where it was non-detectable. Uh, cholesterol tends to be pretty low. Last time I got it checked, uh, I think my LDL was at 85. It's uh, still slightly above ideal. You you generally want your LDL below 70, but that's still not too bad. Um, HbA1c, blood glucose, um, those are just normal levels, non-diabetic. So, um, and I'm in pretty damn good shape physically. Um, my cardiovascular capacity is pretty good. Uh, very strong. I just recently benched 410 pounds. Do you take supplements? Yeah, so I do take creatine and I uh, do use uh, protein powder supplements. But as far as like bodybuilding supplements, um, that's it. Uh, I have taken a peptide before. It's called TB500. Um, I had a shoulder injury that just wasn't healing very quickly. So I took that for, uh, I think, a three or four week course. Um, as far as, you know, banned WADA drugs, that's all I've had. And um, I do just take, uh, you know, multivitamin. In terms of promoting the vegan diet and lifestyle, do you have a recommendation for people out there? Do you recommend just do it and let the results speak for themselves? Or do you tell people, go out there and do debates? Or do you just tell each person, each person's different, uh, do what you got to do? Yeah, so everyone should go vegan. There is not a single person on the planet that shouldn't be on a vegan diet. I believe animals should have the same rights as human beings, and as such, there isn't any human on the planet that should be eating meat and animal products. Um, as far as vegan activism, I don't think it's for everybody. Uh, some people are just really bad at debating. Uh, some people are just very bad at communicating some of their own ideas. And, um, you know, not everybody wants the smoke. Not everybody wants to be like a social media figure. I don't think you have an obligation to do activism. I think you just have an obligation not to violate animal rights. And, you know, if you want to be an influence within your own family or your own group of friends or community, that's fine. Uh, you know, you can lead by example and show people you can be strong and healthy as a vegan and you can tell them about the ethical benefits um, but if you actually want to go out and do activism, I would say, you know, that's just a personal choice. It's great if you do it. Um, you know, I would encourage people to do activism, but it's just not for everybody. In your personal relationships, uh, do you have friends, uh, like are all your friends vegan? And if not, uh, do you try to talk to your friends about this or, or do you not even friend people who are not vegan? How do you deal with your personal relationships? So currently people, uh, among the people that I would actually call friends, uh, they're all vegan. Um, I have had friends that I've kept for years while I was, you know, um, after I transitioned to vegan, uh, veganism who were not vegan. I don't think it's a good idea for vegans to completely ostracize everybody who eats meat uh you do still want to have relationships with these people um the more vegans they know the more likely they are to become vegan so you don't want like you may be the only vegan they meet um in their lifetime um you you don't want to you know create a situation where okay the only vegan they meet in their lifetime never talks to them again, completely ostracizes them, and then they're just left wondering, okay, this vegan thing is weird. Uh, I guess the vegans don't want to be friends with me. You want to have these conversations with people. Uh, any kind of, like every time you hang out with uh, you know a non-vegan, anytime you have a meal with them, it's an opportunity to 
you know, preach the gospel, so to speak, uh, and tell them, you know, what they're doing to their health is terrible. What they're doing to the animals is terrible. And if you maintain a close relationship with them and they see that you're doing well, you're healthier than before, you're more energetic, uh, you're more compassionate. Um, you know, you can lead by example and they're more likely to go vegan. What's your marital status? Are you single, married? Girlfriend? I'm married. You're married? Yeah. Okay. Is your girlfriend vegan as well? Yeah. Yeah. She's okay. married. Uh, yeah. My wife, she's vegan. I'm sorry, your wife. Sorry about this. So if there are obviously people that have been vegans a long time that the, the media gets to them or something and some people change, some people, whether... For whatever reason, some people change their thinking over the years. So what do you do if you're married to somebody and maybe not necessarily you particular, but if somebody's married to somebody and they're both vegans and then one of the people in a relationship, for whatever reason, decides they want to include animals, maybe a vegetarian or or eating animals or maybe just milk. Do you think that's a... Uh, like some people will be okay. That's your body. Other people might say, well, no, I'm not going to deal with that. Especially when kids are involved. Now it's like, yeah. so what's your suggestion of how people can deal with that? And what's too extreme? I mean, is this worth a divorce or is that just slow down there? Um, I, I would say in a situation like that, um, you're probably, better off divorcing the person probably the reason is like these are massive massive ethical differences that you have between the person um that is guaranteed to cause strain on the relationship um i i just i i've seen it myself in most cases these relationships just don't work out you have somebody who is anti you know genocide and murder and then you have somebody who's pro genocide and murder like they're they're just so those two ideas are just so diametrically opposed to one another i don't see relationships generally working out well um on top of that especially when you're talking about like you know when kids get involved i would say w arguably it may even be worse um a worse moral outcome for you to like for you to be in a relationship with somebody who eats meat and have children who are now much more likely to eat meat you've just bred you know serial killers into the world um you now have a new human being that is going to have his own environmental footprint on top of uh just being a serial killer. So um, that's one of the worst things you can possibly do. Uh, it, it may even arguably worse than you personally eating meat uh, because now you've duplicated yourself and now there's now multiple serial killers in the world. From a health standpoint, uh, there's many different types of a vegan diet. There's the junk food vegan diet. Then there's the uh, I'm on a raw food diet, and then there are some people that are eating a vegan diet, but they're like into bodybuilding, and they're really looking at it from that standpoint. Uh, so do you think from a health standpoint, it really matters as long as you're not eating animals and animal products, you're good? Or do you think it could be you could be an unhealthy uh, vegan and that's acceptable? Like, what's your personal opinion about all of this? Yeah, so... I think there needs to be appropriate dietary planning so that uh, this kind of lifestyle is sustainable. I've especially seen a lot of people from the raw food community quit the vegan lifestyle. Um, you know, there was raw lineman, Elise Parker. Uh, there was that um, there was that other woman who was like South American. Yeah, she ended up quitting. She got caught eating fish at a restaurant. Yeah, Ravana, um, I think her name. Yeah, was. Ravana. Yeah. Um, seen a, a yeah Bobby's perspective. He was you know doing the raw thing for a while, and then he ended up quitting. Um, yeah, so this requires appropriate dietary planning. Uh, I, I think the types. Uh, I, I think there's a, like a few reasons why maybe from that particular community you see quite a, a few ex vegans. 
One is they may not have really been interested in the ethics to begin with um, because they're focusing on like some some very strange dietary pattern that most people don't follow. Like they're just mostly eating raw foods or raw foods exclusively. So they may not have really been so concerned about the ethics and they're focusing more on nutrition. So when their, you know, nutrition and health kind of failed them, they didn't really care about going back to eating meat. And um, secondly, there's a lot of raw foodists who just do not have proper dietary planning. Uh, and a lot of them also don't take supplements. So they won't supplement with B12, which you absolutely need as a vegan or else you're going to have problems. So, um, yeah, a lot of these people end up uh, basically becoming anorexic. I've seen Bobby's perspective. He absolutely had anorexia at one point. He was massively underweight and just not eating enough period, uh, probably not eating enough of the right foods. Um, I've seen a few uh, raw foodists with anorexia who are massively underweight. When well, I'm not, I'm not talking about raw foodists in general. I'm talking about, yeah, I know. like, you know, because there are a lot of vegans that are eating a junk food ve vegan diet that aren't doing it the right way. And Well, yeah, um, I, I, I'm sure these people will also have like health issues or are putting their health at risk and they might also quit the the lifestyle if they're not getting enough nutrition um i i've just seen this particularly from the raw community where they get anorexia severely underweight or severe malnutrition and they end up quitting um I, I don't know too many junk food vegans uh, personally. I haven't seen too many of them on YouTube. I don't know if they're particularly at high risk. Uh, I know um, a guy from the Vegan Zombies channel. He went vegan when I think he was in high school and he was like just eating like Oreos and potato chips and stuff. He ended up getting hospitalized and then realizing pretty quickly that you do have to have appropriate dietary planning or else you're, you're just not going to last. So um, regardless of what kind of dietary pattern you're eating, uh, you know, you might be eating like a high protein diet for bodybuilding. You might be eating like mostly junk food, you know, just doing whatever or a raw food diet. You absolutely have to have dietary planning. And you absolutely need to supplement with B12. What other supplements do you think are essential or is that the only one? So B12 is the only supplement where you absolutely 100% need it as a vegan. Uh, there's no way to get B12 from quote unquote natural food sources. So you absolutely have to take a B12 supplement. Uh, most people are going to need a vitamin D supplement. There's very, very few food sources of vitamin D, especially if you're vegan. Um, think for carnus, uh, fish is going to be the biggest dietary source of vitamin D. Uh, obviously, we can't eat fish. Um, you can get vitamin D from UV exposed mushrooms, but Again, those are kind of hard to come by. They're not too common. So uh, most people are going to need a vitamin D supplement, uh, especially if you have darker skin. The getting, vi like producing your own vitamin D from sunlight isn't a reliable source. Uh, on top of that, if you look at some of the uh, nutrition data, um, so just surveys looking at nutrition intake and status among vegans, uh, vegans do have a tendency to be iodine deficient. Um, you don't need to take an iodine supplement. You can easily get iodine just from eating um, like seaweed. That's a very significant source of iodine. Um, there are some iodine containing foods, but it kind of depends where you're sourcing them. So Potatoes can be high in iodine. Uh, some berries can be high in iodine, but again, it's not necessarily the most reliable thing. So you might want to just make sure that occasionally you're eating some sea vegetables. 
Um, and vegans also tend to have much lower zinc status. So um, just eating some high zinc foods, uh, making sure you eat some beans, lentils, and uh, some nuts and seeds like hemp seeds, uh, just to make sure your zinc intake is adequate. Okay, what's your opinion about the omega threes and the fatty acids? Yeah, so I think there's much more evidence that supplementing with omega-3 in the form of EPA and DHA is beneficial for children. Um, that does seem to have beneficial effects on a developing brain. When you're talking about adulthood, there's really not much good evidence suggesting that EPA DHA has beneficial effects for cognitive performance. Um, there's mixed evidence suggesting that it may or may not have a small benefit in terms of heart disease prevention. Uh, the principal risk factor for heart disease is obviously cholesterol. So... Um, adding an EPA or DHA supplement uh, into your supplement routine probably isn't going to have a big impact on heart disease risk. Uh, and again, the data kind of shows that if you look at large, uh, large meta-analyses of randomized trials, either there's no detectable benefit or there's a slight benefit to taking EPA, DHA. So um, what I can say for sure is uh, if you're an adult and you're not planning on getting pregnant, there may be a slight benefit to taking an EPA DHA supplement. So, um, you know, if if you want to check all your boxes and make sure you're getting as much benefit out of your supplement routine as you can, um, taking an EPA DHA supplement's fine. I haven't seen any evidence of it causing harm. And there may be a slight benefit for adults. For children, uh, you can make a much stronger case that um, that is a supplement that would benefit uh, a developing child. So um, that's my stance on EPA DHA. And do you know many women that got pregnant that were vegan? Not personally, no. Okay. Um, I do know a few, but... Um, I, I, I don't have a big friend network and I'm also like I, I me and my wife aren't interested in having kids. OK, OK. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for answering that. Now, as being a, a vegan advocate, uh, what would you like to see? I mean, we got uh, a new political race in the United States and JFK Jr., uh, who's into health, RFK Jr., who's into health, was talking about processed foods and things like this. I'm not sure where he stands on the the vegan standpoint, but what would you like to see, whether in politics or just whether in social media? What's your ultimate goal? I mean, ultimately, everyone would stop eating animals and, and killing animals, but what are you trying to accomplish in, with, with what you do and getting the word out? Yeah, so I'm just trying to... Uh turn as many people vegan um, as I can. So I try to have debates. Um, I post videos, um, a lot of videos reacting to other fitness YouTubers. And I just try to convince people that this is not only a superior ethical lifestyle, um, but it's also a superior you know, health and fitness lifestyle. Um, as far as what I want to see from, you know, the vegan movement and vegan activism, uh, I, I think a huge, huge help to the whole vegan movement is going to be lab grown meat. Uh, I think when that ends up coming out into the market, that's going to be a huge threat to, uh, you know, the traditional meat industry. And a lot of these, uh, you know, lab-grown meat startups, they, if not right now, are are using vegan methods to grow their lab-grown meat. Um, and if not now, they they are going to use that in the future. So, I, I think uh, the roadmap to a vegan world is going to involve lab-grown meat and. Eventually, once it becomes economically viable, it's just going to push out 
these, uh, you know, conventional animal products. Uh, and eventually, hopefully, there is legislation passed to just ban conventional animal agriculture. Um, and it, it makes sense from a public health standpoint. Uh, most zoonotic disease transmission is caused by animal agriculture. Uh, you know, our most recent pandemic, uh, that was caused by, you know, people in China at these wet markets uh, allowing these animals to come into close proximity to one another. And then, you know, these, you know, the coronavirus was just passed on to humans. Um, these flu pandemics, uh, you know, there, there's been some new swine flu outbreaks. Again, that's from animal agriculture. So to minimize the likelihood of pandemic disease, to increase food security, because we're currently giving uh, most of our agriculture in the form of like corn, soybeans, to animals, doesn't really make sense. So we're going to have a bigger world population in the next few decades and if we use the current agricultural system that we have now, we're going to have trouble feeding everybody. So there's very practical reasons why the government would be interested in banning animal agriculture. And if there is a more viable alternative, uh, you know, in the form of lab grown meat, uh, I see that as a realistic possibility that conventional animal agriculture will eventually be banned. Hopefully in our lifetime. So from a lab-grown meat standpoint, would you consider that uh, eth uh, an ethical way to eat animal products or do you consider it just as ethically wrong? It, uh, it can be depending on how, um, how the lab-grown meat is grown. So depending on how they get these uh, animal cells uh, the growth medium that it's grown in, it may or may not be vegan. Uh, so I think there's a few uh, lab-grown meat startups that are using vegan methods, but uh, most of them currently aren't. They're using uh, animal stem cells that are taken from like animal embryos. Um, they're using uh, literally animal blood uh as part of the growth medium so they are still killing exploiting animals uh but there are some startups that are just using you know purely vegan growth mediums and they're just taking tissue biopsies from animals so um i i would say that would be vegan friendly okay so could you ever see if these methods well, you said you didn't like meat, so I guess that answered the question. Because I was going to ask, can you ever see if these methods are done in a vegan way, you ever eating? Uh, uh, yeah, probably like not. Yeah, um, I, I don't really have an interest in eating real meat. And the, you know, mock meat alternatives we have now, um, it's our, there's already good evidence showing that they are healthier than real meat. So they're lower in saturated fat. They don't have any cholesterol. And... Um, they uh, they also have a bit of fiber as well. So and, and they taste amazing. Um, I really love the texture. It, it's consistent all the way through. You don't get like weird bits of connective tissue or anything. So um, yeah, I I really love the mock meats uh, that they have now. I like that. I like them better than real meat. So. I, I just don't have any motivation to, even if it's lab grown, to, you know, eat that. Um, out of curiosity, I might try it like once, but, just, you know, just to see how it is, as long as the lab grown meat's vegan friendly. Sure. But I, I don't see me myself eating something like that regularly. Sure. Great information, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, everybody, this is Vegan Gains. Uh, Richard, you can contact him or see his, his information and his videos on his YouTube channel. I'm going to put the link below and he's on social media. Uh, definitely, uh, check out his stuff because he's a excellent advocate for just, uh, making people aware of this. What was that movie you said you saw that made you go to a vegan diet? What was the name of that? 
Yeah, I think it was uh, Gary Orofsky, Best Speech Ever Told. I, th I think that's the name. Okay, I'll have to get a link to that and post that below. Uh, anything you want to add before we finish? Um, yeah, so regardless of what sort of dietary pattern you choose to follow, I know you advocate for a raw food diet. I don't. Um, you know, there's always a different way to eat on a vegan diet. So if you don't feel well eating a raw food diet, you can still eat vegan cooked foods. So please don't just go back to eating meat if you feel the raw food diet isn't working out. You can eat an innumerable amount of ways on a plant-based diet. So just think about the ethics, think about the animals first and foremost. And if you're not able to sustain a vegan lifestyle on the current diet you're on, just change your diet. There's uh, an innumerable amount of ways you can eat uh, as a vegan. Uh, there's no excuse to ever quit the diet. Okay, yeah, I actually don't uh, advocate that. I'm into this for a disease reason. I was sick with a disease and I want people to uh, overcome disease and avoid disease. And however, they're practically able to do that. So definitely very few people are able to eat 100% raw vegan or have the motivation of a disease to do so. So I promote, you know, people being consistent at what they're doing. And I'd much rather see somebody eat a lot of raw foods and eat some cooked food than eat 100% raw and not be successful long term. Yeah. Uh, but uh, like, like you say, you know, as long as people can get off eating the animals and the animal products and figure out a way to make it work where they could still be healthy. Um, I'm not in favor of a junk food vegan diet. I, from a health standpoint, uh, I think uh, it's it's not an answer, but there's definitely a real way to be healthy and be a vegan, whether it's cooked or raw or a combination of both. And that's what I promote. And I appreciate you for promoting people figuring it out what's working for them, not just based on how they feel, but on, on actual information, which is important. So I appreciate you doing that. And I, I encourage you to keep up the great work and I uh, thank you for everything you're doing, man. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. All right. All right, everybody. Put your comments and questions below. I'm going to put those links below. Have a blessed day, everybody. And uh, thank you for watching. And uh, thank you again, uh, Rob, uh, Richard, for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Nature's wealth, good for your health. This is the Raw Life Health Show. Raw Life, brighten up your life.